Hi everyone. On this video from Count Backwards from 10, we're going to take a look at the pharmacology of anticholinergic medications and acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. The reason I want to go over this topic, and it's one of my favorites, is that anecdotally I've noticed many students and residents who are faced constantly with the struggle of trying to remember which have what effect on the body. When I ask, I always hear people trying to remember the dumbbells mnemonic or the hot as a hair, dry as a bone thing, and I don't know, it just doesn't Seem, it seems to make it more complicated than it needs to be. So my job here is to make those mnemonics and memory tricks obsolete, at least for this topic, and for you to never have to feel like you have to memorize them again. So let's get started. I like to teach this topic from the standpoint of evolution. Our bodies are very smart. They've had a lot of time to learn, and as a result, they tend to do exactly what you would expect them to do. So let's define a few terms. The first that I have here is the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems. The parasympathetic nervous system is colloquial, colloquially referred to as our rest and digest system. And the job of this is going to be to calm our body down, digest food, do really exactly what it says. And this is in stark contrast to our sympathetic nervous system, which is our colloquially named flight or fight, which I just said backwards, fight or flight response. And this is going to rev us up. It's going to, you know, make us ready to either run away from uh, an imminent threat or get ready to fight off a predator. So let's start first with the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors here in green. So first, what do they do? Well, they work by inhibiting the enzyme acetylcholinesterase, which is responsible for breaking down acetylcholine which ultimately leads to an increase in our acetylcholine levels in our pre- and postsynaptic cleft. Now what we have to define is what acetylcholine does. And as it turns out, acetylcholine is the main neurotransmitter in our parasympathetic nervous system. So when we block our acetylcholinesterases, we lead to an increase in our acetylcholine which leads to an increase in our parasympathetic tone. So what happens when we increase our parasympathetic tone? Anything that you expect to happen when you rest and digest. So really all I do from here anytime I talk to students is pick an organ system and tell me what you think happens when you're resting and digesting. How about the eyes? Well, the eyes are going to constrict and you're going to get meiosis. Specifically the pupils, not the eyes, but the pupils constrict. And this makes sense from an evolutionary standpoint. You don't need to see that much. This is in stark contrast to when you're fighting or flighting and your pupils need to dilate so you can see more of your surroundings. Next, how about the heart? Well, the heart is going to become bradycardic. It's going to beat slower. And really, it's the same idea. Why? Well, when you're fighting or flighting, you have an increased sympathetic response. You want to increase your heart rate, increase your cardiac output to ensure adequate oxygenation to your muscles so that you can fight or run. But when you're resting and digesting, sending blood and oxygen to peripheral tissue really isn't that important. Therefore, your heart needs to work less. The GI tract, another big one. What happens? Well, it's the same. It's, it's literally in the name, rest and digest. That's exactly what our bodies do. They digest have bowel movements, all that good stuff. We shunt blood to the GI tract in an attempt to improve peristalsis and the movement and absorption of whatever food we just or are about to eat. Airway is a big one. So what happens with our airway? Well, we're going to get bronchial constriction. And again, we're going to come back to the evolutionary concept of fighting or flighting. If you're getting ready to run, you dilate your bronchi so that you can improve oxygenation and ventilation, so you can breathe faster, increase our minute ventilation. But again, when we're resting and digesting, we really don't need to do that. And so this can cause bronchospasm or bronchoconstriction uh, as a result. So all of these things that happen make sense from an evolutionary standpoint. So when we're in the operating room, we give things like acetylcholinesterase inhibitors like neostigmine or pyridostigmine. It's also the reason why we have to give anticholinergics with them. Because if we don't, 
then we could get an unopposed effects such as severe bradycardia, which can lead to cardiac arrest, or the inability to oxygenate and ventilate because our patients have such severe bronchospasm. So that now leads us to our other side, our anticholinergics. And as the name suggests, they are anti-acetylcholine. Anti-acetylcholine. Their mechanism of action is that they competitively bind to the ganglionic nicotinic receptors of the autonomic nervous system and subsequently prevents acetylcholine from binding. As a result, we block our parasympathetic response, thus promoting the sympathetic tone. So what does this look like? Well, everything the opposite of what we just discussed. You become tachycardic, again, because we are invoking our our sympathetic nervous system, so your heart's going to go ahead and start beating faster. Your respiratory rate increases. Bronchioles dilate. You can experience medriasis, which is pupillary dilation. And maybe you get constipated. Your bowels don't really move. And really, the reason is, is that your body does exactly what you would expect it to do. The moral of this lesson is really to articulate the idea that while mnemonics can be great and little sayings and poems and things, at the end of the day, physiologically, oftentimes, the body acts the way we expect it to. And sometimes we just need to take a second, step back from the memorizing that we've been used to doing in medical school, and kind of recognize how the information makes sense to us in real life. So next time you experience a question like this on your exam or someone asks you about it, all you have to do is ask yourself, what do you think the body would do or what do you think that organ system would do if it either had to run or fight or if it was just relaxing? As always, if you have any questions, feel free to write to us. If you're interested in getting involved, please let us know. Otherwise, follow us on Instagram, account backwards from 10. Subscribe below. And as always, stay tuned for our next video.